So, hi, I'm uh, Tony Anscombe. We're going to talk about uh, a project that was kind of a, an accident, wasn't it? Accidental yeah, research. Yeah, some accidental research. So, thank you for attending. Um, there's the disclaimer that we're required to put up for, for RSA. We we'll skipped past that. I'm Tony Anscombe, Chief Security Evangelist for ESET, and this is my esteemed colleague, Indeed. Cameron Kemp. Security researcher. Yeah, he's the, he's the clever one, I think. No. No? Okay. There's our contact details here. We'll also put them back up, up at the end as well. If there's anything you want to ask us that you don't want to ask in a Q&A, feel free to reach out to either of us, and uh, we'll happily answer questions. So we have an agenda for today. We're going to talk about how this research got started. And I, like I say, we kind of just said it was by accident, and we'll explain what we mean by that in a moment and how we then went about acquiring some hardware on the secondary market, uh, and then what we discovered on that hardware and the consequences of it, and how you should be disposing of things uh, responsibly. And more to the point, are we giving cyber criminals the upper hand uh, in actually our everyday processes? And then we're gonna talk about how you really dispose of it. I think we got some quite inventive ideas for that. We do. So we decided to create, in fact, Cameron, you decided. Yeah. So we were going to uh, build an, uh, a lab. We, as you know, some of you know, we said we do some deep, geeky research. And so we were going to look at some honeypots. Uh, we were going to look at things like uh, RDP attacks. We watch those in the news. Uh, exchange, whatever, outside plant, if we're going to ICS or IoT. And so that's what we were going to do. And so we were going to look at the traffic and look at some of these attacks that are in place and, and um, feed them back to some of the guys around the world that, that look at this kind of thing. So in order to do that, we actually wanted to create a real world test scenario. So um, the way to do that is kind of you know, get as high resolution equipment as you can. Uh, do the, you know, the, the versions of a Microsoft Exchange you're looking at, some of the ICS equipment, not Siemens, but whatever. And so we were gonna do that. And we wanted to do that uh, by testing as real world uh, configuration as we could. So something that would really emulate a corporate environment. And to do that, uh, next slide, we decided to go out and get a router and so get something that somebody would use something to be typical something that a lot of you in this room have and so we went out to the secondary market because again we wanted to test something that's very real world and uh, plus we're cheap so uh, we didn't actually get the stack of computers we got uh, routers and um, well they weren't damaged like this but they were there were certainly some, pro some surprises on there. Next slide. In fact, that shows how cheap we were, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't afford the image of the routers. No. Uh, anyway, so, so, so we, we just found a licensable oh, yeah. one that was for free. Yeah. Um, but this is a big market. Now, I, I think when we started this project, I hadn't appreciated just how big actually the secondary market was. Um, if you think about all the hardware that gets resold from laptops, phones, routers, networking equipment, there's a massive for sale out there. Uh, and globally, that's estimated to be $24.5 billion. And this is a, a number from the Global Industry Analytics Company. But even just here in the US last year, it's worth $6.4 billion, right? Which is a huge, huge marketplace. So maybe I hadn't appreciated the, the size and, and scope of this. So before we get into the details of kind of what we did and what we found, does anybody in the room know what happens when you decommission a piece of networking equipment in your own company? Right, and yeah, but so you store it. So in twenty years' time, you need a bigger story. <laughs> so I'm just <laughs> you must have a big storage room, but there's. Well, that's, that's a good one. That's good. Yeah, we might call you up later on. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody actually return it to a lease company? Yeah. Does anybody actually send it? It's a managed service provision. And that, right. So do you know what happens to it? Supposed to. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing. <laughs> we'll come back to that. He does it himself. I like that. Right. Uh -huh. Good. So we, we might come back to some, some, yeah. some of you. So there was this Friday. Friday. And uh, let, let's just be clear. This was a Friday at four o'clock. 
Yeah. You know, five o'clock is beer o'clock. Yeah. So he called me at four o'clock. I did. When all the good security disclosures happened. So Friday at four, basically what happened is uh, we got our first router in. We were trying to take a look at it. And we noticed there's a host name. We went, well, there shouldn't be a host name. Not if he had it, because he's going to do the destruction. It's got a host name. Okay. What are we looking at? And we were able to find, as it turns out, a whole treasure trove of uh, core network routing for a an A-list uh, Silicon Valley firm. And so the good news is, is we're on lots of trust groups, so we're all sharing information in, you know, obviously a trusted environment. And so I got a hold of Tony and said, look, I think I found something. What do we do? Friday afternoon. Yeah, it's like you want to get that call Friday afternoon. So but Tony just happened to know somebody on uh, the, with the, at the company or be able to get in touch with them. Well, and I'd say they're an A-plus company. Yeah. I, yeah. I'd actually say they're beyond an A. Yeah. Uh, and sure enough, well, I, li I live here in the Bay Area, so I know lots of people at some of the different Silicon Valley companies. And I called them, and we had a really good experience with this company, because what they did was they put together a team of people, ga gathered the right people into a room. They clearly had a policy and a process for somebody telling them there was a vulnerability in their system, which is really positive. And it was a good experience. It was a good experience, and uh, plus I got the t-shirt, and that's really all I want out of life. <laughs> I want the t-shirt. But why is router data so important? Well, and so we started digging into the data, and I'm a sort of an old network guy, kind of net network, Linux, that kind of thing. And so we started digging into the data and looking at, basically, we have a, basically a roadmap of your organization. Not only your local sites, but also um, yeah, remote sites that you may have. We have a list of applications in a lot of cases, and we'll get into some of the detail on that today. Um, we, have, uh, we have a list of a map of all the exploitable surfaces, potentially exploitable surfaces. Luckily, we're the good guys. Uh, but also, if you're an, uh, an attacker, you, that's stage one of the recon. I mean, you have a complete roadmap of the organization, what the apps are, and you can use it as an impersonation tool, which is uh, quite frightening, especially, you know, I've worked in networks a long time. It's, that's scary stuff. Next slide. So we decided to uh, get some more routers, um, you know, just to find out whether it was a one-off or, or not. And so uh, we picked some the usual suspects, the ASA series, uh, Fortinet series, SRX, you know, the Juniper networks. I mean, this is, you know, between the three of them, that's, that's a lot of traffic on the internet. Um, and so we picked some that were a little bit older, a couple years older, maybe coming off lease, and uh, looked at those. Next slide. And what we found was, we started with a simple methodology. I mean, obviously, you know, you get this thing, you gotta boot it up, find out what you got, find out whether it's DOA. We actually had one that's DOA, but Find out what you have. We started seeing more and more host names. And so we started looking at, well, okay, we, we get into deep dive. I mean, we get into, you know, chip caps and all this kind of craziness and reversing firmware and everything like that as far as our IoT. We, we, that's, that's normal for us. We didn't even have to get that far. That's what made me re very, very nervous. So, of course, we didn't hook to the network and we were in a secure lab environment, which they stayed. But basically, we weren't even at the point of using any special research, research tools. So clearly, they had not come from your organization. Because otherwise, <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation. Next slide. And so we got uh, a couple of them. So if you, those of you who are networking, I mean, it's quite often to have a, a master-slave configuration. So um, in some cases, we actually got both of the nodes. But by looking at the configuration, you could determine that there was a mirror, uh, a mirror device. So that got us concerned. So like, we have one. OK, where's the other one? And so that was kind of a problem. We started looking at, like, oh, you know, we, we may have a bigger issue. Next slide. We had some that were actually securely wiped from his place, I think. And um, good, yay, awesome, we can get back to our research. But that was only five. Next slide. And of course, two of them were pretty good. Uh, they were actually had some decent diligence, and that's what we love to see. Next slide. One was DOA, as I mentioned. Um, and so, uh, big worry sounds, but wouldn't boot. So that would be what you'd expect in the secondary market. Next slide. So. Here's what we found on the remaining nine routers. Yeah. Did you take the chip out of the Juniper and put it in the line on your CPU? No, uh, no, because we're lazy, first of all, and we thought we'd do that later if we didn't get good results. It's like, yeah, we could do that, but. It does work. I have six of them. There you go. There you go. Yeah, we didn't have to get that far, but good point. So here's what we saw. I'm going to walk up here closer to this so I can kind of see it. This is where we started to get very, very concerned. So now, now this, uh, so you can see, obviously you've got uh, radius authentication, probably site-wide or to multiple sites, because you're looking at a, you know, a 10 network. Um, 
you have the root authentication password is encrypted, which is actually crack crackable. The crypto hash is crack crackable. But then you also have, um, it, in the lower uh, section here, you have not just admins, but site-wide admins that were actually specific to that organization. That's when I start to get nervous because that tells me if I'm able to get into that user, which is you know pre, uh, appended or prepended with a before the admin, which was pretty specific to the organization, they probably use that as site-wide authentication. So it's get, it just keeps getting worse and worse. And um, so just this, we're starting to go, oh my gosh, next slide. We found LDAP uh, directory, so now we have a comp company directory. We know where the remote offices are, we know the data centers that the, the organization's peered with, and of course we're anonymizing all the information, you know, the goal is not to the goal is to help the community, so we're, you know, we really had to work at this. But we found a, a full company directories, remote offices. Next slide. We found customer data. Again, we're getting nervous, more and more nervous in talking to peers going, okay, what should we do with this? What's the best way to help the community? Obviously, we're at RSA. That's the best way, we think. So internal storage location, in other words, whether they had internal NAS or storage or whatever they have, external storage in the cloud, remote offsite backup. And the customer information, we found 22% of the ones that we looked at had that information. Next slide. And we think that would be a real issue for a regulator. So while the information held on the router probably doesn't actually main, mean you need to go and notify a regulator that you've had a potential breach, i.e. because you've sent the data out. Uh, so for example, under CPRA, I believe it's about 500 customer records before you have to actually notify the state attorney general. But we think a regulator, if you then ended up having a data breach because of the information that was on a device that you sold openly on the secondary market, we think the regulator would take a really dim view of this. Uh, and certainly in Europe and here in California uh, and elsewhere in the world, there, there is strong privacy regulation. Um, but another interesting angle on this is, I kind of wonder, I mean, how many people in the room have cyber risk insurance? Yeah, a, a big a chunk of, of you. I, you know, I'm just curious of what your cyber, cyber risk insurer would say, that you actually sold the information to the person that's now attacking you. I wonder whether it, you've actually invalidated your cyber risk insurance policy. So I'm just flagging that, that I think there's a whole issue here around your customer data being on these devices or giving access to the customer data. So, additional compromised information. We have third-party data. This is got yeah, creepy in a whole never, a whole other area. I mean, you have third-party data. There's, there's all kinds of peering, you know, at the, with an organization. You're going to be peering with third-party providers. That's that's normal. Uh, business partners. We saw one that was a legal counsel for the firm for the for the original organization. Uh, connected businesses, and so then we got to thinking. Well, a secondary attack, you know, patch the hatch, but with routers. Um, if you could gain, and 33% of them had that kind of information, if you could gain that information, you would stand to potentially put a third party at risk as well. So maybe you weren't the direct attack, but obviously your router's gonna authenticate because we have keys, so that might be an issue. Here is the kind of thing when we're talking about the specificity of the, of the actual internal organization. You have the normal things like Gmail, which you would expect, but you also have some very specific um, information about specific individuals. Um, so specific tech, uh, technologies, some specific uh, malware they were trying to brack, uh, block, Amazon uh, Web Services, and, and you look at the end of slash, two, th means, slash 32 means it's just one individual, so that's very specific. It's not a block, it's not a subnet, it's like that's that one individual. So if you're thinking like an attacker, you would have lots of things to attack, like, uh, like the FTP server, and for um, poten potentially specific uh, applications that may have vulnerabilities, like you know, at the top, Contagix. I don't know what that is, but it's very specific. So that's kind of the, the kind of things we found. Trusted parties, if you can, I mean, this is low level access. So if you trade cryptographic hashes or instead of IKE or IPsec keys, I mean, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be very seamless. You could siphon off lots of information. Certificates and cryptographic tokens, 44% of them had those. Uh, next slide. Yeah, router to router authentication. So quite often you would have the topology of whatever their swarm of data center connection connectivity may be. You could look at that. Some some had remote offsite manufacturing processes. We were able to know exactly where that was and what physical location in that case. Eighty nine percent of them have some way to authenticate with other machine to machine or other devices. Next slide. So now we if if you're thinking like an attacker, now you can basically sit in the middle and an adversary in the middle clone that machine, 
and now you have cryptographic hashes that are going to, they're going to uh, appear nicely, but you also have the IPs. So you're able, depending on what you're able to spoof, now you can actually get, um, you know, past the hash, but with routers. Um, and the third parties trust this device. Third party organ and also third party organizations trust this device, probably. That IoT, the, you know, the perimeter's kind of everywhere. We're gonna hear a lot about this this week. So basically you can spend less, fish, less time fishing and more time attacking, and that's truly concerning, I think. Next slide. Um, the confirmation, you know, specific application, it was not only internal, but it was external as well. So everybody's got kind of, a lot of people have kind of a hybrid environment. So you got cloud applications and uh, sometimes uh, they interact with internal a applications like caching servers or something like that. The on-premise apps, and also we know all of the firewall rules that are gonna allow traffic and in what cases are gonna allow traffic from this specific ap application in the public to internal. Also, of course, we knew what the internal, what they had hosted on site. Next slide. 89% of them had that. So why should we be scared? Well, we should be scared because when Cam turned around and sent, sent the, the application list for all the different devices that we we'd actually found data on. It was like, well, hang on a minute. Th this application list has got some specificity to it. I, suddenly I can start to understand what versions of applications are where in the organizations. Surely this is opening up a vulnerability in the organization itself because some of those applications might be public facing. And of course, we're all familiar, well, I hope everybody in the room is familiar with the CVE uh, numbering system and vulnerability reporting system. And if you look at the CVE database and then go back, looking at the specific applications and the version numbers, you can start to then ascertain, well, this application hasn't been patched. Now, okay, there's a delay between the router coming out of the network and us buying it and us finding the data, and it may have been patched in the middle. But you can tell you know, roughly when it stopped being used and how freak, you know, whether it was even at the right patch level at that time. So, we looked, and these, these are in the wrong order, by the way. At one should be at three here, because th these, these kind of build to the worst severity. So at one in the, in, the, in the list was the top ranked, the one that frequently most, it was most seen across all of the routers. Um, but at one, if you look at it, in 2022 had three CVEs with a severity of 4.9. So there's a potential issue here, but it got worse as we kind of looked down the ranking. and the more commonly used apps across all of these devices. You know, app 2 had 9 in 2023, and bear in mind we put this presentation together about uh, five weeks ago. Something like that. So this number's probably already grown from there, but with a maximum severity of 8.3. And the third in the list had a maximum severity of 9. So now you're sitting on not only a device that's got all the credentials and all the trusted certificates, etc. But you're also sitting on information that actually tells you what's being run on the inside of the organization and potentially what versions are running. So therefore, you've got this whole app list is creating a vulnerability in itself. So if you're thinking like a cyber attacker, obviously you have a well-documented recon list. I mean, that's the first thing I was thinking to myself, gosh, just dump this into Metasploit and have a nice day but um, adversary in the middle. You can act as an insider, so social engineering. And secondary targets, I think, is uh, you know, kind of the thought with like cyber insurance. We'll have a little time later, but it would be really interesting to dig into what you guys think about what the, the, how the cyber security insurance would, would deal with something like that. We may have time. We may have to uh, take it after this talk. But a ransomware, oh my gosh. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite convincing, I think, because you're going to have a lot of the kind of uh, credentials that you would need to pull off a successful ransomware attack, and of course there's other creative ways we probably hadn't think of, thought of. Next slide. So we have the data, and now it was about, okay, we, we've conducted our research. Now we had, obviously, the experience of router number one, yeah. where actually we immediately <coughs> contacted the company uh, whose data we were sitting on. Uh, uh, but it was, what do we do next? You know, how do we actually go out and tell people? Because if you were, you know, we're a software vendor, if you're gonna tell us something, then that's very different. We've got a vulnerability disclosure policy, and most tech companies do, and it's fairly easy for you to come and tell us ab about things that might be flaws, bugs, whatever, in software. But when we kind of turn the tables and turn and say, you're the corporate end user, how are we gonna tell you? And what do we tell you, and how do we tell you? We can't put all this information in an email and just send it to you, because actually, that would be bad in itself. So, so we've got this huge issue of how to tell you. 
Now, if you look at the companies involved, so if, if we, uh, and please note, we're, we're not disclosing any of the names of the companies purposely today, but if we look at the industry sectors that these companies were involved in, I mean, there are large tech companies in here, as we've already said, there's a, a legal company, and we're gonna come back to them in a, in a moment, but we've had an MSP, a data center, et cetera, and there's a mix. There's no pattern here of what type of company is actually falling foul or becoming a victim, I'd say a victim, but it's the victim of their own making to a certain degree, is falling foul of this. So there's no, you know, there's no real re rhyme or reason of, of who is gonna be involved. And if you look at the, we took the employee numbers and revenue numbers from public information. So you can see, enterprise all the way down to small business. And we run, as a company, um, how, how many of you are familiar with us as ESET? Now, the ESET people sitting here didn't put their hand up. That mm. gives me a real problem, yeah? Um, but we, we are a research company with products. Yeah, so primarily we're a research company and we do coordinated disclosure an awful lot. So if you, if you follow the research we do, you'll know that we're a very responsible company. And typically, coordinated disclosure is between 60 and 100 day, 120 days. So we find a vulnerability in something and you give somebody a period of time to fix it. Now, typically, that period of time from us is 90 days before you then disclose it publicly. So a, the company who have the issue are on a clock. But this, is all this all changes with something like routers because it's not really a vulnerability to fix in software. We're telling you that potentially this data from your organization is out in the public domain. So how you fix it is, is somewhat diff uh, different. So that's coordinated disclosure. And if you look at our history of doing this, like I said, as a research company, uh, we do this frequently. And to give you a feel for it, Crook, uh, which I think was back in 2019, was a vulnerability we found in a Wi-Fi chipset. Now think of this, the chipset was used by multiple vendors, so Amazon, Apple, Samsung, you, know, you name it, the there was lots of vendors using this particular chipset. So it took a period of time for this to flow down into the hardware devices, firmware upgrades, then software upgrades, et cetera. So from actually us notifying them to it becoming public was 14 months. So I'm just pointing out we are very much on helping people, giving them time, and actually working with people on fixing these type of things. But what's your experience? What was the experience, Ken? Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> Holy smokes, I will just say, the tech companies were actually lovely. We, we, had the, we had the call or the whatever, the dialogue. I got the t-shirt, that's the most important thing. We went on. There was a lot of other companies that, oh my gosh. And I think they all, like we're, we dove into that. Like, why, why do they think we're contacting? You know, I'm a researcher and they're like, yeah, sir, sure. So I'm like, no, we probably need to talk. So that was a really interesting dynamic. And we dove into that. And Tony, I think, works more on the corporate side and he's trying to like figure out, well, how do these corporations want us to get a hold of you? It's kind of an interesting question. We're not selling anything. Next slide. Well, we do sell things on occasion, but the problem is, is if you look at your own inbox this morning, you'll see a whole heap of contact requests. In fact, just, just leading into RSA. As a speaker at RSA, my word, do you get some spam, yeah? My CEO is attending RSA, you know, blah, blah, blah. Would you like to meet them? No, I wouldn't. So we're well aware of we're well, we're well aware of what these calls are like. But the problem is, as a security researcher, and we both tried this with different companies, is you're ringing the company, you're contacting them through LinkedIn, you're trying them through Twitter, you're trying them through multiple ways. Because as corporate companies, you don't have that contact base to allow somebody to connect to you, which is a problem. Yeah. Um, so. We, we hit the, the, the sales wall, I think it was. They thought we were trying to sell something where actually what we were trying to do was disclose to them that they should be doing something about this. And actually we were willing to help them. And help them for free, Yeah. more yeah. importantly. Um, so it was painful. It was very, very painful. I think people thought we were scamming them in some way. And there were a couple of companies that shocked us. Um, one of them, well. So you think, okay, we're at RSA. There's a lot of PR people. There's a lot of you know marketing folks around there. Nothing bad, but okay. We have your router. <laughs> we have information that you obviously don't want. You think what crisis communication PR? That's what they do. We could never get a hold of them. 
We're like, okay, what if you're a PR agent and you have a crisis communication? There was just no way. We were all the way up to the sea level and just never got anywhere. And then there was one that I tried, a law, a law company. Now, you would assume a bunch of lawyers would take this really seriously and understand the consequences of actually having one of their devices out there and understand that they might be in breach of regulations or their cyber insurance policy and all, all these things. You would assume lawyers would take this very seriously. Interestingly, yeah, their social media team did. And they communicated back and turned and said, yeah, we've passed the information to the IT team, you should hear from them. Great, and that's where it stopped. And even when we followed up again, with the social media team, hey, we haven't heard from your IT team. Well, we've been passing it to them, they're doing nothing, sorry. And that's where we hit the roadblock. So these two, com these two particular organizations, we failed to connect with. I we mean, we did. Connect, we did connect with them, but sort of. we failed to actually get past or to somebody that would actually take this issue seriously. So if you're one of those companies, come find us afterwards. We still want to talk, we're friends. In fact, I'd just leave the room. <laughs> Anybody that leaves next is from one of those from companies, them. so watch the door. Yeah. Um, but I, there's a question for you here. If we had one of your devices, is there a method for us to contact you? I mean, do you have, how many people in the room actually can turn and say on their website there is a method for somebody external to the company to contact their IT team and tell them about uh, your, your that doesn't, you don't count, yeah. sorry. <laughs> there are certain people in the room we know, yeah. Um, but you know, do we have a method of communicating with you? And I think as corporate companies, the answer is probably the majority of you are gonna turn around and say, actually no, there isn't. So we are reliant on the methods we used and we believe this to be somewhat of a problem. Now if you talk about software vendors, you know, we typically have bug bounty programs or similar or vulnerability notifications. And if you look at the bug bounty system, um, it's an increase, it, this is a hugely increasing market. So software vendors are taking notification back into tech companies very seriously. And the difference between the 300 million and the 5 billion over the next four years shows how seriously it's been taken. That's also though, partly due because there's a secondary market for people selling network access, which we will come back to in just a moment, um, which is why vendors are having to pay a lot more to bug bounty programs. But if you look at you know, bug bounty programs, you can earn some big money if you're, a, if you're a good researcher like Cam who finds something, potentially you can actually go out and earn some cash. Lockdown mode on Apple, cryptocurrency exchanges pay out huge amounts of money, of course, because if somebody finds a vulnerability in their exchange software, that can cost them dearly if some, somebody uh, starts exploiting it. And Microsoft, Google, you know, as you'd expect. Um, and there are, like I say, there's, there's a dark side of this market. There's, you can take credentials and you can sell them, or you can take vulnerabilities you find and sell them to brokers, and those brokers will sell them on the gray market. So there's a black market and then a gray market. On this gray market, potentially, if you find a zero-click vulnerability in a mobile operating system, yeah, that's exploitable and you've done a proof of concept of the exploit, you could earn two and a half million dollars for it. Yeah, so everybody's gonna get their laptops out now. Yeah, go find one. Um, and it, but if we come back to our routers and look at just the credentials on the routers, so how much does network access sell for? And network access, what I mean by this is typically a fished set of credentials or a, somebody's managed to crack an RDP set of credentials and they're selling those credentials on the dark net. Yeah? Um, the firm Keeler Cy uh, Cybercrime Prevention uh, run a, a frequently on a quarterly basis look at the cost of what these credentials sell for on the dark net. And roughly speaking, it's $2,800 per set of credentials. So remember, the person getting access isn't the person that then typically attacks. These things get passed along, so it's very difficult to understand who created the attack and who, who did it and who, uh, who was the perpetrator behind it. But 2,800, now, if we look at the data that was on these devices, I mean, firstly, I think you could make more than $2,800, and there was a lot more data on there that you could go off and sell. Yeah. But it could be very lucrative, couldn't it? A $75 router you buy on a secondary market you plug it in, take the configuration off it, you go onto the dark web 
and sell the credentials for $2,800. Please don't do that. Yeah, Cam, Cam, I'm not going to do that. But where did you get the money for the Lamborghini? No one knows. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But how prevalent is the issue? Well, I think what was surprising to me, it was probably not surprising that some of the more, uh, I would say, larger corporations had quite a bit more sophistication in terms of the configuration, in terms of the technologies that they would roll, roll out. I mean, you know, small mom and pop companies are not going to roll out BGP and all this kind of stuff. But the larger companies would and did. Um, but it was really spread uh, across from a small, medium to enterprise. It really, it really kind of spread all across the, why? Because everybody needs a router. If you've got a network, you have a router. And so, uh, you know, that was kind of amazing. There are certain network devices that had, it was, I think, probably not more vulnerable, but here's the thing. On these routers, there are a lot of them have security uh, implement, things you can implement. They just weren't. So, and also, of course, I have them on, you know, on the, uh, in the lab, so there's a problem with that. What other devices? Well, I mean, uh, clearly now you, you have the router, you could, you could look at any of the IoT devices. We had physical security, physical building access, video, internal video systems, video conferencing systems. I mean, you pick it, you name it, uh, it, was, it was touched by the router. Next slide. Well, and, and just, to, yeah, but just to add to that, I mean, other people have done this type of research historically. If you look back 10 years, people did research into hard disks and memory keys and other, other things. But I think what shocked us was that this is not an endpoint device. This is a core, a core networking device that's actually kind of containing the crown jewels of the company on it. So, you know, we, we kind of, I think that shocked us a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the roadmap of the entire company. So, and in fact, in fact, a lot of people at a company don't even know how their network is laid out. They would just be network engineers and maybe some security people. Just network engineers. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know. Um, so what do you do? How do you decommission something correctly? Um, well, firstly, you need to understand where, where everything is uh, and who's responsible for it. And I think a lot of companies suffer, suffer from this. I mean, if you go back through privacy legislation, companies needed to audit where all their data was and where their records are kept, et cetera. You need to make sure you've got a big picture of where all the hardware is in the company that might have this type of data on it. So that's number, the number one thing. And we have some recommendations for decommissioning. Yeah? Um, we think it would be great to actually supplement your income. Yeah? And actually, when you take the device out the rack, you know, go onto the dark net, sell it. <laughs> yeah? We think that would be a useful place. That's Tony's to advice. Do. Yeah. That, sorry, that was my one. Yeah. Your one's next, though. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I live in the middle of, you know, so heavy equipment, I would yeah. say. Um, you know, stick it under the giant pokey thing at the back there. That's one thing you could do. And of course, there's always incendiary devices. Uh, th th that's other, another option that we have. That is actually his yellow Lamborghini. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's what he claimed. So, I mean, there's, yeah, but of course we're joking. I mean, this is obviously not the solution. We know the solution. You take it out into the desert, you blow it up. Yeah. <laughs> this is what you do to it. Because then, you know, you're having fun and you're getting rid of the hardware. No, on a serious note, we are, of course, joking. What, there are good written guidelines of actually decommissioning hardware. Um, now, I'm kind of curious of how many people actually in the audience have a policy, a written policy internally for decommissioning hardware. Good. That is awesome. That's maybe half. Well, well, that, well, it's kind of awesome. So, yeah, but what's interesting about that, that's roughly half, would you agree? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. 56% of the routers that we purchased had data on them. So the other half that didn't put their hands up <laughs> actually maybe shows a reasonable, yeah, that, that actually matches our number. But there are uh, some very good, NIST published some guidelines, 888R1. We'd recommend actually you know, taking the framework that NIST have. Uh, you know, there are other frameworks, but actually using their framework as the checklist of decommissioning hardware. Now, they go into removable media in routers and stuff like that, of actually how to destroy the removable media, if it's removable, and how to destroy the chipsets, etc. And it goes down into great detail. So we recommend uh, looking at the NIST paperwork for this. Now, one thing we had long discussions around, I can tell you this, is, is you know, there's a group of us that were involved in this. We had long discussions of 
if you're sending it, uh, and I think uh, the gentleman down there, who's on his phone, <sighs> yeah, I've stopped him now, <laughs> yeah, who's on his phone, um, he's, yeah, he's, he provides it to a third party, and the third party decommission it. Um, now, my question is, do you, do you go and audit the third party on a frequent basis to make sure, actually, that what comes off their production line and goes out their door, goods outwards, is clean? Now, there's a problem with this, because they've probably got thousands of devices from different companies coming in, but you, can't, you can't, probably can't work out whether they're actually wiping your device correctly, but just auditing their process and standing on that production line and goods out at their end and making sure that all devices are going out clean every six months, we think would be a valuable thing to go and do. But it's complicated, we understand that. And companies will pro these companies that do sanitization will probably try not to, not to do this. Well, when they did that, there was one that they claimed had been sanitized, and I'm looking at, you don't have a power supply. Clearly, you didn't do anything, because this is a really specific power supply. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, we had one, actually, who, who they claimed it had been stolen. Yeah. Yeah, we will say we returned that one. Yeah, because we didn't want stolen, pro well, he didn't want stolen property at his, his lab. Yeah, I didn't see the problem with it. Yeah, I'd already called the sheriff. Um, but, as you, you know, make sure you're going to audit these third parties. And we also think, um, um, part of the NIST framework, and, and I think this is probably one of the most important things, is actually when you take a piece of equipment out, out of the rack, actually who took it out, who was responsible for the next actions. You know, what was on it, where was it plugged in, you know, what information was on it, who decommissioned it, you know, who's, who then sent it out to the third party, or who, who wiped the data on it to make sure it was clean. You know, if you're selling them yourselves, who listed it. Have this all recorded, so that if something happens, so for example, somebody like us is calling you in three months' time saying, hey, you know, we've landed on this piece of hardware that's got all this information on it, you can actually immediately go back find the person responsible in the company and turn and say, what was on it? You know, do you have a backup of what was on it? Can we look at it? Can we see the consequences of what it might mean? So we think this is a super important piece. And this is a huge market. The sanitization market is a massive market. Again, I, maybe before this project, I hadn't realized just how big some of these, uh, some of these are. 7.2 billion by 2026. And you can see today, $3.3 .3 billion is spent on sanitizing uh, media in this way in, in the US, um, which means there's some big, yeah, some big companies out there making money doing this. So make sure the companies you're using are doing this correctly. And of course, then there's electronic sta uh, recycling standards. Now, one thing you, know, you could argue that of, well, okay, let's just destroy the hardware. You know, when it leaves our organization, if we destroy it, there's never going to be a problem. But actually, I think we both agree that recycling hardware in this way is a good thing. It is, but uh, there's, there's just so many issues with the whole recycling chain, and that's a separate conversation, but we hope to at least raise the conversation, and, and these guys have some guidelines on that, so. They certainly do. So, you know, check out the standards around re uh, electronics recycling. So what do you do if you discover, you know, if you're cam on a four o'clock uh, on a Friday afternoon, what do you do if you actually discover information like this on a piece of hardware that maybe you guys have got in? Now, I say that, uh, and I say this, it doesn't necessarily mean you have purchased something on the secondary market. So I happened to meet somebody last week um, who's, who worked for uh, part of DOD at some stage, and they had, uh, I won't mention the vendor, they had a, a hardware swap out policy. So if something went wrong or they needed another one, they just asked for it. And he was explaining that actually frequently they would get devices coming in. So they'd just call off another device, a networking device from this company, and it would come in and it had the previous configuration still on it. And not always from within the federal government. So this company, this commercial company, a, a, a manufacturer, clearly had the same program in place for commercial companies, uh, a hot swap or whatever you want to define it, and actually they were sending them without wiping them to the next one that was called off. So this isn't, my point here is, it might not be you buying it on the secondary market, you might be bringing it from somewhere else. So on a, on a hot swap basis. But if you find information like this, the best thing we can recommend you do is contact the regional office of CISA and tell them. 
And the reason we say this is throughout our process, we struggled to contact these companies and find the right people. And then in a conversation with some of the CISA team, um, at the end of our project, they turned and said, well, if you're really stuck, yeah, let us know. We'll call them. Yeah, so we think that's the best place you can actually go and take the information and let CISA deal with the company whose data you might be sitting on. Um, because a, a call from the federal government, you might have answered. Because <laughs> they're unlikely to be selling anything. Well, we'd hope, yeah? Um, mm -hmm. But my point is, is, you know, go and do it responsibly, tell somebody, and securely store the device because you are sitting on somebody else's uh, corporate data. So we wanted to have, this is just a, a quick note, and then we'll get to the Q&A coming up. We got just a few minutes left. And again, if we catch you today, fine. Meet us at the booth. What find us somewhere. But be a good corporate citizen. Like if we get, if you get a call from a shady company, you're probably not going to answer the phone. That means you, as people who are in the in the industry, try to be a good corporate citizen and quite, try to be friendly. Don't call threatening. Just you know, try to develop a, a, a trust. We're all we're all trying to secure some things, so we don't need to create any enemies. Um, so that's you know, we're all trying to do security. We're all we're all working on the same team. We got to get to the Q and A pretty quick. I think we got a last slide, and then we'll get to some questions. So what's the takeaway from this? Well, the takeaway from this is that actually you need to be conscious of what happens to the decommissioned hardware that leaves your business, you know, whether it's operational or whether it's not. You know, even if you've got something where the power supply's gone, it comes out the rack and you're putting it to a side, it's still got data on it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't fix the power supply and take the data off or find some way of decommissioning it safely, even if it's not working. So there's, you know, if you're using third parties, make sure you're auditing them, make sure you understand the process that's going on. But more to the point, I come back to the question I asked right at the start of, you know, what happens to the decommissioned hardware in your company? If you don't know, if you were one of the, one of the people that didn't put your hand up or didn't offer what, you, what happens to it now, please go find out, yeah? Because this is a real issue. Um, potentially you're selling or, or you're departing data to cyber criminals. You're giving cyber criminals the upper hand because you're providing them the data they need to come and attack you and you're providing it without too much difficulty. You know, they don't have to do the legwork to get it. Um, so that's important. So thank you for listening. There's our email addresses. Now we're open for, for questions. And if they're t difficult technical ones, Cam's open. Yeah, no confessions, yeah, please. Yeah. Any questions we got? No questions. Yeah. What do you got? Yeah. We've, think it's more general, like, we've seen. So did everybody? Uh, did everybody hear yeah, the question? Yeah. The question is, do you see this action in the real world? Is there an example, or is it theoretical? We've seen variations of this, uh, actually, quite recently. And um, our goal is not to tell people how to hack. So that it is an area of focus for uh, certain threat actors. To answer your question, anybody else? And also, he mentioned about he's, he's concerned with mobile phone disposal as well. Anybody else? Yeah. That was actually really kind of a convoluted story. We can talk about it afterwards. Any other questions? They, it was weird. <laughs> Anybody else? Enjoy the show. Stick around. Uh, we're Cam and Tony. Well, Come track us down. Well, before you, uh, before sorry, you go, before you leave. If there's any ESET partners in the room, we have a breakfast tomorrow morning that yeah. we'd like you to come and attend. And we've got a private threat intelligence briefing if anybody's interested in coming along on uh, tomorrow, tomorrow lunchtime as well. Enjoy RSA. So, thank you. Thanks for coming.